Welcome to the 244th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today is a discussion of astrobiology, big science, and the pandemic with astronomer Lucianne Walkowicz. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls Live at its new time, weekdays at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time on YouTube. Just go to the COVID Calls YouTube channel to watch. Friday episodes will soon be moving to Korea time, and I'll keep you posted about those episodes. And you can also watch COVID Calls on Facebook Live, Twitch, and Periscope. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. And please feel free to suggest yourself as a future guest. As of today, March 23rd, 2021, there are 2,725,516 deaths from COVID-19 globally. That's according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center. The death toll in the United States has climbed to 542,993 deaths from COVID-19. In Iceland, there are 29 deaths reported. Greenland reports 29 cases of COVID-19 and no deaths. The island nation of Vanuatu reports three cases of COVID-19, no deaths. As a way to bring some humanity to the numbers, I've been reading a life story or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic in some way, and I'd like to continue that now. The headline is Stuart Boyer, astronomer who lent his ear to the cosmos, dies at 86. This appeared October 15th, 2020 in the New York Times by Dennis Overby. Only the hottest stars shine with the searing but invisible blue beyond blue light called ultraviolet. When Stuart Boyer arrived as a rangy and voluble young professor at the University of California, Berkeley in 1968, no telescopes could see these stars in their glory. Nor did astronomers or the rest of humanity know whether anybody else was out there, whether the airwaves might be full of alien beeps and crackles from cosmic ham radio operators trying to say hi or to warn with a watch out about those nukes and that rising carbon dioxide. Dr. Boyer devoted his career to closing the cognitive gap on both counts. At Berkeley, he led teams that sent instruments into space on balloons, sounding rockets, the space shuttle, and finally his own satellite to reveal more than a thousand stars, galaxies, and raging gas clouds illuminating the cosmos in a new color. On the ground, he also pioneered the search for signals from extraterrestrial civilizations. If they were there, building Berkeley into a world center in the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, or SETI. Dr. Boyer died on August, uh, excuse me, Dr. Boyer died on September 23rd at his home in Orinda, California. He was 86. The university said the cause was complications of COVID-19. His former colleagues described Dr. Boyer as bigger than life, both in size and in spirit, a brash man you either loved or hated. He put his whole body and soul into things, said Dan Wertheimer, the Maryland and Watson Alberts Chair and Chief Scientist at the Berkeley SETI Research Center. Dr. Wertheimer recalled that Dr. Boyer and his wife, Janet Jane Baker Boyer, an education professor at nearby Mills College, had cultivated a Japanese garden in their backyard, the most serene place you could imagine, and they also attended Burning Man. Dr. Boyer made his biggest mark with his ultraviolet studies of the universe. Ultraviolet rays with wavelengths shorter than visible light and longer than X-rays are not only invisible to the eye, the more extreme short wavelength kind are difficult to focus with conventional optics. But many important astrophysical and atomic processes involving hydrogen, abundant element in the universe and in stars, give off ultraviolet light. Dr. Boyer's Effort to extend astronomy into the missing ultraviolet zone was resisted at first. The atmosphere absorbs ultraviolet rays before they hit the ground, preventing humans from seeing the hottest stars and blazing plasmas. A view from space was required, Dr. Boyer argued, but many astronomers thought there would still be nothing to see. 
the thin gas that pervades interstellar space would absorb all the ultraviolet light, they said. But Dr. Boyer persisted, and he proved they were wrong. A sensor that he and his team mounted on the Apollo Soyuz, a joint US Soviet mission in 1975, detected extreme ultraviolet radiation from some dead stars known as hot white dwarfs and an exploding star called a nova. Dr. Boyer followed up by proposing an entire satellite devoted to this work, the Extreme Ultraviolet Explorer, or EUVE, in 1977. It was finally launched in 1992, and it circled Earth for eight years. It charted some 1,200 cosmic sources of this extreme radiation from as far away as distant galaxies, where it tagged vast, previously unsuspected clouds of so-called cool gas, haunting the centers of many of those galaxies. Dr. Boyer's other passion was alien life. He was inspired by the Cyclops Report, a 1971 NASA study that proposed a giant array of radio telescopes to search the sky for alien radio signals. Cyclops was never built, but in 1977, Dr. Boyer started his own search using the University of California radio telescope at Hat Creek near Mount Lassen in Northern California. The search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations, or serendip as it was known, was designed to piggyback on other astronomers' radio observations. In the background, it would scan 100 radio frequencies or channels at a time, hoping to tune in ET. Charles Stuart Boyer was born on August 2, 1934, in Toledo, Ohio, to Howard and Elizabeth Boyer. His father was a pilot. As a boy, he attended a one room grade school near his father's farm in Orland Park, Illinois, before going on to be valedictorian at Orland Park High School. He graduated from Miami University of Ohio with a degree in physics, and then earned a PhD from the Catholic University of America in Washington in 1965. Dr. Boyer landed in the Berkeley Astronomy Department and the Space Sciences Laboratory. He made the department into a booming center for space astronomy and the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. At his peak, he had some 150 scientists and engineers working for him on various space projects. Dr. Boyer retired as a professor in 1994, but continued doing research as the director of the Center for Extreme Ultraviolet Astrophysics at Berkeley. Serendip survived and in 1999 became SETI at Home, which farmed out radio data to home computers to analyze. The University of California now serves as headquarters for the biggest search for cosmic greetings yet, the $100 million Breakthrough Listen effort. Dr. Boyer is survived by his wife, two sons, William and Robert, a daughter, Elizabeth, and five grandchildren. SETI at home took a break earlier this year to analyze all its data, but the search goes on. Okay, let me introduce my guest for today, a conversation I've been very much looking forward to. Lucianne Walkowicz is an astronomer at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago and the co-founder of the Just Space Alliance. Walkowicz studies the ethics of Mars exploration, stellar magnetic activity, how stars influence a planet's suitability as a host for alien life, and how to use advanced computing to discover unusual events in large astronomical data sets. From 2017 to 2018, they were the Baruch S. Bloomberg NASA LO Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology, Library of Congress. Walkowicz is the founding director of the LSSTC Data Science Fellowship Program, an initiative to provide astronomy graduate students with training in advanced computing. Walkowicz speaks and writes regularly on topics at the intersection of science and society, which have appeared on TED.com, Slate, The Washington Post, Vox, and more. Walkowicz holds a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from Johns Hopkins University, a master's and PhD in astronomy from the University of Washington, and held postdoctoral fellowships at UC Berkeley and Princeton prior to joining the Adler Planetarium. They are also a TED senior fellow and a practicing artist, working in a variety of media from performance to sound. And Lucianne Walkowicz was a DJ in college, and maybe we'll hear more about that. Lucian Walkovich, thank you so much for joining me on COVID Calls today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Let me start the way I usually do, just to find out where you're calling in from and what the pandemic is looking like there and what the vaccination situation is looking like there too. 
Yeah, um, I'm calling in from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I'm based. Um, I am in my home, <laughs> like most people are here. Uh, pandemic situation is um, tenuous, I would say, uh, in the sense that um, right now Chicago is experiencing fairly low positivity rate. We've we've been around three percent for a while, which is much better than we were doing um, for the past several months. Um, it probably hasn't been this low since the end of the summer last year. Um, but unfortunately, we're also seeing that rate tick back up because the bars and restaurants and businesses are reopening. And we have basically every variant, I think, that is known um, circulating here. So, uh, you know, I would, I would say like, we're doing a lot better. Um, vaccines are rolling out. We just uh, opened a new um, mass vaccination site and I was able to get my first shot, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's been interesting here, especially because Chicago gets its supply of vaccine from the federal government. And so whatever the state does is different from what the city of Chicago does because our supply is different. Um, so in many cases, vaccines have been more available to the rest of the state than they have been for people in the city of Chicago. Um, so yeah, we're all kind of, you know, plodding along, hoping to get everybody vaccinated before we end up with whatever wave we're on now. <laughs> I feel like uh, just because of the pace of the pandemic that um, San Francisco and New York got so much of the early media oxygen around, you know, in the early days. And I haven't talked to that many guests from Chicago. Maybe you can say just a little bit about what kind of March, April and May of, of last year was like. Was it similar to, to New York and other places? I mean, it must have been quiet, closed, and, and uncanny to see a city like Chicago kind of come to a, a screeching halt. Yeah, certainly. Um, we sort of, I, I think citywide, we locked down um, around the middle of March last year, um, uh, around March 13th or so. And, um, you know, I think it, it's it been, um, I think, very curious to see sort of our city government and the state government and the federal government to try to navigate understanding what to do when. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I think I personally find frustrating, probably because I'm a scientist and I sit and stare at all the like facts and figures and <laughs> all of those graphs on the like COVID city dashboard, um, you know, I've been pouring over them now for a solid year. And, uh, you know, we've moved through these various phases of uh, things being like completely closed. And now, of course, daily rates for infection are like much worse than they were when the city was completely closed, but things are open. Um, so it's a, uh, you know, and I, I don't think um, the things we know about transmission have changed that much since we had more strict closures. Um, and yeah, I, I would say, you know, in Chicago, much like a lot of places, uh, it has been um, stunning to see the lengths that our governance will go through to make sure that capitalism can keep rolling um, while people get sick and die, not to put too fine a point on it. No, I think that's the blunt kind of language we absolutely need. How else can you understand why even in states where the governance around the pandemic was pretty good, uh, last year, all of a sudden, they seem to be throwing caution to the wind to to reopen. I wonder what was the vibe at the vaccination center? Um, it reminded me a lot of the movie Arrival. <laughs> um, just because in Arrival, you know, you you see lots of people moving through various like FEMA tents. Um, so uh, the vaccination center is in our like major sports center, but it's not in the center itself. It's um, it's in these various tents outside. And it's actually one of the more organized experiences <laughs> I've had. Um, I, it's also very strange for me because I, I have a high risk profile for COVID. And so um, I, you know, haven't really been in anywhere for over a year for the most part. Um, so it's more people than I've been around for a little while, but actually it was very well organized, um, kind of right up until the very end where they put you in like the room where you are supposed to wait and see if you have an allergic reaction where we're just like, we're here now. And like, nobody told us what to do. <laughs> so, you know, you sort of like enter like a uh, FEMA purgatory <laughs> where you're just like hanging out. <laughs> um, you just wait yeah. to see. 
Wow. Yeah. So I would I would say um, the vibe was I uh, kind of somber, except for um, the the people working there who were like, "Congratulations on getting your first dose!" And I really <laughs> were they really they were <laughs> they were really amped up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. And they they know that, I mean, this vaccination process has had so many fits and starts and people are anxious about this medicine. I'm not surprised that maybe they, they feel they need to be a bit of a pep squad, I suppose, in that regard. Yeah, for sure. You know, and like Chicago, you know, I think um, we are a city that is predominantly not white. You know, like the majority of Chicagoans are Black and Latinx. And um, like there is very reasonable uh, suspicion of especially like anything the government does, but also because of a long history of medical racism, there is a lot of like caution, I would say around, um, you know, getting vaccinated and, uh, you know, also there has been like tremendously, uh, tremendously confusing guidance. And, you know, if I find it flummoxing that our rates are just as high as they were when we were completely shut down. So does everybody else, right? Um, so, you know, I think uh, the piece of it that I can kind of do is I, I talk to a lot of people about, you know, like how excited I am to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to get the vaccine um, and how much I've been waiting for this. And, you know, I think being really honest about, you know, vaccines and their sort of, um, imperfections uh, is also important because, you know, people, I think the next challenge, right, is that people who are vaccinated, we don't actually know um, what role they play in transmitting COVID to other people who are not vaccinated. And so, mm -hmm. you know, this is an ongoing science communication challenge, frankly, um, where trust plays a huge role. That's what I was sort of imagining you there at the, at the center and being an expert science communicator and at the core of that, and I know this is something you do really well, which is like not to explain science as like, here's a bunch of things we know, but to try to explain science as here's some things we know and some things we don't know in this sort of zone of uncertainty in between. And let's get into that. That's been a yeah. challenge with this pandemic. I wonder sort of your impressions of watching science communicators try to grapple with that in real time. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's really hard because a lot of the um, the doubts that people have, the caution that people have, there's a very wide continuum of that. So, you know, at, at some end you have like this conspiracy theorists who are like way, way out there with like the government is putting microchips in us. Um, and then there's a very, very broad swath of caution from, you know, people who just don't want to feel bad um, or don't understand like the differences between vaccines. That's something we're seeing all across the world, right? Is people um, not wanting to take like the Johnson and Johnson single dose vaccine because they perceive it as being subpar when in fact it actually is not. Um, and so, you know, I think the the challenge for all science communicators, like always, not just in the pandemic is that all the research on science communication tells us that it's actually like not a matter of distributing facts to people, especially over controversial issues. You know, like we, we see this with like climate change, for example, that the thing that makes people willing to receive and process new information is usually a personal connection with the person they're talking to. And so that means that as a scientist, you know, we, no matter what you're talking about, but particularly things that are tied to people's worldviews, if you are going in and just sort of dropping off the facts, often people who don't believe in climate change have all of the same facts. They've just incorporated that information mm -hmm. into the frame of their worldview in a different way that you have, um, which seems, I think, unthinkable and also ex is extremely frustrating for a lot of scientists. Um, particularly those who haven't really like thought about the fact that there's literature on like what works and what doesn't in science communication. And, you know, scientists, like we're convinced by facts, but that's also a function of our worldview and our training. Right. Um, and so it's, it's a very sticky challenge, particularly because normally, um, you know, when you talk about controversial things, climate change does have a death toll associated with it. It just has a very slow progression. Yeah. And with COVID, that's not the case. And so it, it I think, exacerbates scientists' feeling of frustration and then also like 
people's feeling of frustrations with scientists yelling at them <laughs> and just yeah. shouting facts. And, and, you know, I get it on both sides. Like I also feel like shouting at people too. <laughs> Let's go a little further with this. I, I want to sort of ask you more generally about your work, but just since we started on the science communication piece that, um, you know, so much of what's going on right now, of course, if people are wondering and uh, getting up to speed on microorganisms. Um, so you're right with sort of shared facts and, and data visualization has come a long way. I do think there's a lot of sort of public health information people can get to quickly on their phones or on their computers. But, you know, what's happening at the bench level is still pretty mysterious to most people in part because not everybody's invited in at the bench level and also because what's happening involves um, very specific techniques and modes of seeing. And I, I was thinking about that in preparation for this call. And of course, that's the world you're in too. I mean, people can conjure a picture of a planetarium or, or a telescope um, or the night sky and their experience with stars, but you have to serve in this very curious translation role because you, you know how to see, see um, things and then translate that to people um, who are not seeing those things. And so I've thought about that symmetry a little bit between your work and you know what sort of microbiologists might be doing at this time. It really puts a special emphasis on what you were saying before, this kind of like reaching a, a point of trust maybe with the public or a shared curiosity. I just want to draw you out a little bit more on that, on how you develop rapport with an audience. Yeah, um, I think it's challenging, right? Because I, much in the way that, um, you know, you, you mentioned telescopes, for example, like people do have an image of what like an astronomer looking in through a telescope looks like, but also that image is not right. <laughs> like most people imagine that I work at night, that I like look through some like long tube and that I use yeah. my eyeball to like look at the cosmos. And that's actually like universally not true. Um, like normally I actually work during the day and I download data from telescopes that are in space that I have no ability to put my eyeball up to, you know, and I work with my laptop. A lot of what I do looks like computer programming, not at all like what people imagine. And so I'm sure that there's symmetry there and that what I imagine a microbiologist doing, I'm sure is like totally wrong. Like, you know, I have this like high school biology picture yeah. in my mind or like CSI actually has been instrumental actually in getting a lot of people sure. into like yeah. the biological sciences, yeah. you know, and yeah. you imagine like slides and like a microscope and yeah. I'm sure like there are aspects that resemble that and that like most of it doesn't. Right. right. Um, and so I think uh, it, it's, it's an interesting thought because, you know, I think a lot of what matters to people in the way they attach to um, information is, is emotional content, not like factual content. And it's not necessarily having insight into how it works. Um, you know, the, uh, like, why do we use cell phones? Like I can't, I can tell you probably at a very, very basic level what the cell phone is doing. <laughs> but I can't explain to you how my cell phone works in detail. Like I didn't build the cell phone and I don't work on cell phones. So, you know, like, what do I know about? Well, I know what it feels like to use my cell phone. Um, I know the things that the cell phone makes possible for me. Um, and so, you know, I think it can be helpful to share the process of science with people, but in some sense, people's a willingness to incorporate that information or to believe you as a scientist or to trust you, um, however you want to frame it, is also kind of separated from the technology itself. So I think it can be helpful to unpack how it works, um, in part because that gives insight into the sort of realm of like things that we're like pretty sure are happening, things that are what we call open questions, um, where we don't know what's going on. And then like things we have like kind of a good idea about, but like would like some more information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in any science, there's a there's a big like range of where knowledge of a particular topic is, like not just astronomy as a whole, but like, you know, how life forms. Like we know lots of things about like life on earth, but we don't know anything about life off of earth because we've never found it. And we don't even know really how life on earth got started. <laughs> we know once it once it was around what it did um, and it did all kinds of crazy things, you know, like my favorite biology thing that I have learned in the past several years is that whales evolved into land mammals and then got back in the ocean and evolved back into whales. 
<laughs> so, yeah. you know, um, but I, I, I think it's, um, it's a complicated thing to try and understand like what will help people attach. And so, you know, generally what I like to do is I like to talk with people and find out kind of where they're at and what their questions are. It's, it's a thank you for talking about that in detail, because I really think we've seen this year, particularly this past year with the pandemic, um, the challenges of that. And, and I've been thinking about science training and wondering, you know, if science programs, broadly speaking, graduate programs and uh, are going to be spending more time on that side of things, on the communication side of things, because it's been a life and death issue in the United States and not only in the United States and in that regard. I, I want to ask you a little, so you're an astronomer and you're an astrobiologist, so I'm just going to ask you a blunt question. Why do you care to know if there's life off of Earth? Why does that matter to you? You know, I think it matters to me um, and to sort of our understanding of, of life in general uh, in that we really only have one example of a place in the universe in which life, we know that life has like arisen, uh, ar arisen evolved and exists today, right? And it's planet Earth. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't other life out there. I certainly hope there is other life out there, um, you know, but we don't have any hard evidence for it yet. And to me, one of the one of the great mysteries um, of, you know, I think that one can wonder about is like, where did life come from? And how did we get all of those life forms that exist on this planet? And, you know, I think, a piece of that, that that I am particularly attached to also is what makes it possible for life to start and survive. Um, and, you know, I think when we look at the other planets of our solar system, one of the things that is interesting about Earth and, you know, our two nearest neighbors, Venus and Mars, is that Venus and Mars could have been more hospitable to life in the past. And we certainly see today two places that are really not very hospitable to life. Um, and, you know, if there's any kind of life there, it's not immediately obvious. It is probably not very prolific or we would have maybe seen it by now. Um, but, you know, those are, again, like only where our knowledge is at right now. Um, and so, you know, when we see those planets, one of the questions that comes to mind for me is like, well, what turns a planet that was hospitable for life into a place that is not so hospitable for life? And that's particularly resonant right now as we watch our climate change here on Earth. You know, we don't have a good theory of like how, I mean, we have understandings of what is happening to the Earth's climate and what the possible end states might be, but we don't have lots and lots of examples of planets that have life on them to study things that make planets sustainable and continue their hospitability for, for life. And so for me, it's about kind of the biggest the, at the biggest level, it's understanding the context of the life that exists on this planet in the context of the universe and, um, you know, whether other things are out there, whether they're like us, whether they're like anything on our planet. Um, that's like a huge and I think very interesting question as far as I'm concerned. That's my personal bias. But I think it can also teach us a lot about our own planet as well. There's so many fascinating things in there. And and even as you're describing that, I can imagine there's different populations of people who latch on to one or another set of of those reasons. I mean, let's talk about Mars for a second. NASA has been back in the news in the middle of this pandemic. And I think that was maybe good for a lot of people uh, to take their minds off of the turmoil here on planet Earth to think a little bit about space exploration again. But the minute you start talking about Mars and this the Perseverance rover, for example, it opens up all these different questions. It's, it's well, is possible that you know, it's cosmological questions. Was there life somewhere else? What does that do for the way I think about my place in the universe? Um, or is it possible to colonize Mars? And, and so let's figure that out and, and maybe we can see that in our future. You're talking about your own interest, which is that maybe there was life on Mars. Something happened uh, here that made it inhospitable maybe break those down a little bit. And I'm curious your take, particularly on the let's go and colonize Mars uh, angle. What do you have to say to those who think this is opening up a sort of new age of exploration? Uh, some people have even used the metaphor of the sort of the Columbus, you know, Columbus off of planet Earth. And it's probably, I, I see, I know it's problematic, <laughs> but I, I was sort of curious how you take that in. Because again, as a person who probably doesn't want to, if anybody's interested to know, 
you don't want to necessarily dismiss them, but how do you turn those conversations into more productive conversations? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, let's start a little bit with um, this sort of like, where is Mars now versus where was Mars in the past from a climate standpoint? Mm -hmm. So, you know, today we see a Mars that is um, very cold. Uh, it has a very thin atmosphere. So, you know, part of what makes Earth like a nice cozy place for at least human life and the other life forms that thrive here is that we get a certain amount of light from our sun, keeps us nice and warm, but it's actually our atmosphere that is kind of like the blanket, your, your comforter on your bed, right? It's not just the temperature in the room that you care about, it's how thick is your blanket. So in the case of Mars, um, we think that in the past, Mars had a thicker atmosphere that would have made it possible for Mars to be warmer. Um, and that what we observe in the geology of the, um, the surface of Mars and the rocks that we've studied there with previous Mars landers and orbiters and rovers um, is that there seems to be mineralogy that indicates that there was standing water for a substantial amount of time on the surface of Mars. Now, you know, water doesn't necessarily mean that Mars had life on it, but we do see that here on Earth, places that have water um, usually have an abundance of life and that, you know, wildlife can exist in a variety of different places. Water is kind of the common denominator um, that indicates that life can thrive in a place. Um, now, having said that, uh, you know, we don't have any signs that Mars actually had life on it in the past, but we do have kind of hints that in the past Mars was a more hospitable place for life to get going and maybe exist for a while. So, you know, what happened to Mars um, is one of the, the big questions that people have been looking into um, over these past many years. And one answer is that, you know, Mars is a smaller planet than Earth. Um, so that affects its habitability in two ways. Um, one is that uh, planets um, like Earth have, you know, a certain amount of heat when they form and then they cool off over time, kind of like the, the charcoal perhaps in your grill. Um, but part, part of the reason that's important is that when a planet is melty in its center still, it enables it to have a magnetic field. And on the Earth, we actually have this big magnetic field that not only does things like make compasses work, but it also protects us from high energy radiation from our sun. And on Mars, Mars doesn't really have much of a magnetic field anymore because Mars is smaller. And so much like a smaller you know, log in your fireplace or charcoal bouquet, it's already cooled off and no longer is generating magnetic field in its core anymore. So that means that the um, atmosphere of Mars has been exposed to erosion from the radiation of the sun. And so Mars, even if it had this thicker atmosphere in the past, no longer does today. So in science fiction, and now often in like the sort of science fictions that are spun by various space billionaires who would like to go to Mars, um, there's the idea of um, Mars as, or planets in general, really as kind of like, a, an empty swimming pool that you can just like refill. Um, you know, I've heard like Elon Musk say things like, oh, you know, we'll just like release lots of the carbon dioxide that is in the rocks on Mars into the atmosphere and then it will be warmer and then you can just have liquid water on the surface. And these ideas are um, what broadly get called terraforming, which just means make planet more like Earth. <laughs> right, right. That's all it means. Um, and that idea has been around in science fiction for a very long time. Um, but when you look into the details of it, uh, in order to do something like that to Mars to the point where it was warm enough to have liquid water on the surface, you'd basically have to strip mine the entire planet. Um, and then also that doesn't fix the fact that Mars is very, very dry. So you could pour, you know, you could refill the swimming pool, but it's just gonna evaporate into the air because it's super not humid. Um, and so when you dig into these ideas about like making other worlds hospitable to human life, a lot of times, you know, just below the thinnest veneer are these ideas that make actually places less hospitable to human life. Another big one was um, we're going to, uh, this was another Elon Muskism, um, we're going to set off nuclear weapons over the polar caps of Mars and like melt the ice. It's like, okay, and then what? <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So, you know, there's these, all of these ideas out there. Um, I think a lot of them, it, it's interesting if you, again, dig into the motivations um, for things like that. So, you know, 
take the idea of like humans going to Mars. A lot of people couch that in terms of sort of like existential risk and need. Um, the idea that like, well, Earth will be inhospitable and so we must go move to Mars. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, Mars is like on its best day, far worse than the worst place on Earth. Um, mm -hmm. My friend Shannon Styrone, who's a science writer, just recently wrote a, an article called Mars is a Hellhole, which I think puts it very succinctly. <laughs> Mars is a hellhole compared to the many ways in which um, our planet here is hospitable to life. Now that doesn't mean that humans couldn't go and you know make some kind of a structure in which they could live. Um, you know, it, it isn't that like aspects of being there in the same way that like humans were able to go and visit the moon, right? The moon is also not a place that is super hospitable to life. So it isn't that people couldn't go there. It's that you know when we talk about like why people should go there it doesn't make sense to talk about like Mars as a place that can support human life. When, you know, if we knew how to engineer a planet at the global scale so that its climate didn't kill us, we would be using that technology just right. to make it here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> On this planet. Um, so, you know, and, and furthermore, the, um, the motivations that often get used like, oh, the sun is going to evolve and eventually engulf our planet. Yeah, in like many billions of years, and we will be lucky if we last that long. Or like the the other one I hear a lot is that asteroids are going to hit the Earth. Um, but the thing you never hear is climate change is happening and corporations that billionaires own have responsibility because they are disproportionately responsible for the climate change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I think it's there's this sort of shell game that is happening with... Um, using these like, frankly, very boring, like recycled um, manifest destiny arguments that all come from like European colonization of yep. the Americas yeah. and other, and Pacific, et cetera. Um, that is not to me very visionary. Um, you know, like colonization was very bad for most people that experienced colonization. Right. Um, you know, we bear those, those scars still today. Um, and, so, and now see, you've gotten me ranting and I'm not letting no. you get the edge no, it's, it's <laughs> Exactly. And I, what I just was going to say, I mean, the, the colonization sold, um, you know, those visions of moving to another place, even if people don't have much of a, of a sense of it, has sold a lot of ships and it sold a lot of wagons and it sold a lot of guns and it sold a lot of real estate. And, and so I appreciate the way you sort of frame it and you still, you sort of capture the excitement of, the possibilities, but also sort of like put it in this political frame. And I guess even just to follow up on that, um, uh, I'm sure you're tired of hearing this, but w why do we need politics in our in our science? You you don't have any trouble that I can detect in your work or in our, in this conversation in bringing the, the politics of climate change. Let's just say that discussion right into the center of sort of your science and the way you talk about your science. Is that is that risky at all? Is do, do you run um, are there professional challenges when you start to frame these sorts of things and call out Elon Musk? Um, what's the blowback on something like that for scientists? Yeah, you know, I I'll comment first that you know I don't think that there's anything unnatural at all about it. Um, I guess I come from sort of the school of thought, like thinkers like Donna Haraway, who have said that all knowledge is situated right, and that I you know bring into the practice of science, like my, you know, personal identity and my experiences in the way that everyone does. And so, you know, I, I think it's sort of preposterous to say that there shouldn't be politics in science, because there are always politics in science, whether you're talking about them or not. Now, certain aspects of that, um, you know, are, I think, often the idea of politics in science is weaponized to mean that, you know, like, science just doesn't mean anything, or like, that the methodologies are totally twistable into, um, you know, every which way, and that there's no sort of like ground truths. But I think that that is, that's not what I mean, right? That the, um, the methodologies of science aren't, you know, necessarily changeable because of politics. But ultimately, at the end, you have data and you need to interpret it. And there are many examples from the history of science, you know, for example, uh, example, like the idea of the alpha male comes from like 
uh, some very convoluted animal behavioral <laughs> studies um, that were very much informed by the practitioners who were making them and then taking like animal models and applying them sort of needlessly to human beings. Mm -hmm. And now we have like an entire pickup artist industry that is like built around the idea of something that doesn't actually exist. Um, so, you know, I think the the practice of science always involves the situations that are around us um, and who we are. You know, we always see the world as as the people we are. Now, I think, um, you know, in terms of blowback, um, I think, you know, there's there's certainly, I would say, a very strong um, thread of like angry men on the Internet <laughs> who don't really want to hear um, anything about, you know, uh, how like science might be informed by, you know, a person's like world experiences. Um, you know, in general, people that I think like white supremacy culture, um, you know, and sexism have worked out well for whether they espouse those views or not, often don't want to have their experiences questioned because they, of course, don't want to be told they might have gotten something because of who they are and not because of their merit. And that's, you know, when we get into this sort of idea of there being like a pure meritocracy. Um, you know, and I, I think like this is a, an ideological battle that is that is like <laughs> unfolding before us <laughs> um, in a wide variety of spheres and science is not alone in that, right? Um, you know, I will say that uh, something that I think is related to internet culture specifically is that there are fandoms that are very, um, very uh, interested in abusing and harassing people who bring any kind of critique to the people that they're fans of. And unfortunately, a lot of followers of Elon Musk are exactly like that. Um, you know, I've known a lot of people uh, who, you know, are gender minorities in science or people of color who, you know, can't use their social media for a while um, because they said something bad about Elon Musk. And, you know, I think the the thing is, is that and, and a lot of this is that this like new era of like new space um, private industry being interested in going to space very much comes out of the culture of Silicon Valley, which is very like techno optimistic. And that um, one of the things that I found to be hugely valuable for me as a scientist and a person is constructive critique. And there is a, a strong sort of ideological core of techno optimism that doesn't receive critique well and is not interested in receiving critique well. Um, and I think that's a shame because I would love for us to go to space. I just want us to do it well. And I don't think there's anything worthwhile about European colonization to continue out beyond this planet. I think that was like, we did that experiment already and it went very badly. Um, you know, like it, it really like ruined a lot of things and killed a lot of people and continues to damage people's lives today. I mean, as you say that, I, I can't help but think you're exactly the right, that, that we, that the science that you're doing without the politics could be very dangerous really. And I guess I want to sort of ask you a little bit more about the kind of um, the exploration um, beyond our solar system that is exciting to you, you know, and, and people can find your work. Um, if they could understand the scientific papers, I'm sure they could find that, but they could find you communicating more directly with um, non-experts like me in your TED Talks. And you talk about um, really trying to understand what's happening um, with stars and planets that are very far away. But again, this question of what are the conditions that could make it possible for life on those planets? So not engaged in the colonization discourse, but really more in the discovery discourse. Uh, say a little bit about that and what sort of role space telescopes play in that too. Yeah, um, you know, a lot of what we've learned over the past several years, um, really the past decade or so, I, I worked on a mission called uh, Kepler, uh, which was a space telescope NASA mission that was sent up in uh, 2009 and operated for about 10 years. And, you know, when we were in the you know first days of Kepler, um, there had only been about 400 planets found around other stars. Uh, and within a few years of Kepler being up, now there's thousands and thousands and thousands of planets that are known. Um, you know, Kepler has given way to follow on missions like the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. And, you know, one thing is clear is that we haven't found every planet in the galaxy. 
but we know now that planets around other stars and in particular planets that are on the smaller side so things that are like earth venus mars are actually the most common kinds of planets in the universe which is very exciting um because you know we think of those so-called terrestrial planets the places that have like rocky surfaces you can walk around on as being places that we could look for life as opposed to Jupiter sized planets, which are sort of big balls of gas um, and maybe not, you know, habitable in the sense that you would find life on them. So, you know, over the past many years, we now know not whether there's life out there, but we know there's like a lot of real estate, <laughs> which is exciting. But at the same time, um, you know, we don't know everything about these worlds. In many cases, you know, when we make a press release about a new discovery, for example, it often has like an artist conception that shows, you know, some sort of like permutation of earth, um, you know, somewhere with maybe water or continents or clouds, um, something that is familiar and yet alien-like. And in reality, you know, a lot of times we only know how far it is from its star and therefore like how much light it's getting overall. Um, and we know its size, in some cases, we know it's mass, so how much stuff it's made up of in other cases. If we know those two things together, we're doing really well. But, you know, we don't have the kind of detail that we would love to know about like what its atmosphere is made up of, which we know from our own solar system is so important for understanding those worlds. So in many cases, um, we really study the stars to learn about sort of the conditions the planets exist in. And that's um, my specialty in particular has been studying these things called stellar flares, which are big ejections of high energy radiation um, that you know affect the chemistry and the existence of the atmospheres for the planets themselves. Mm. And and so when you do that that kind of work and you, you're talking about going from 400 sort of known planets to, to thousands and many of them have the profile at least in size that could be like Earth and our near inhabitants. What's the next phase of that? of that work. I was watching one of your TED talks and you sort of, you had the audience really. And then at the end, you said something really great, which is that the next time I talk to you, I'm going to tell you, I want to be able to tell you something else, which is such a great way to leave an audience. <laughs> I love that. And so, so what's next? <laughs> yeah. Um, great question. So what's next is trying to figure out what the planet's atmospheres are actually made of, um, uh, which you would think would right. be super difficult to do because um, you know, we can't actually see the surfaces of any of these other planets. Like we can see the planets in our solar system and then everything else for the most part is um, indirect detections of what is going on with the planet. Um, there's a very, very small handful of planets for which we've actually seen like light reflected off of their surface. But that's a very difficult measurement to make. So in the coming years, one of the things that I'm really excited about is that there's a new telescope, a new mission um, that is often framed as like the follow on to Hubble, you know, this sort of like great observatory. Um, and that's a NASA mission called the JWST or James Webb Space Telescope. And what it will be able to do is look at these planets in what we call infrared light, which is the light that is just beyond sort of the red edge of where the human eye can see. And, you know, in many of these cases where the planet is maybe passing around its parent star and moving in front of it, the light from the star actually shines through the little tiny, like, annulus of the, um, the atmosphere. And we can look at that light and use a special machine called a spectrograph that spreads the light out into its component energies to get essentially a chemical fingerprint of what the atmosphere is made up of. And that's really, like... The, the next sort of big grail is that we really want to understand, you know, do these planets have atmospheres first and foremost? So, you know, we, everything that we see about like our earth indicates that like life is better off here because we have an atmosphere, but then also what's that atmosphere made up of? Because life on earth has influenced the chemical makeup of the atmosphere. You know, we didn't have a bunch of oxygen on earth until the rise of these um, little cyanobacteria that builds these right. um, sort of rocky structures called stromatolites that you can actually see in some beaches on Earth. And, you know, so we know that life has had a big influence on the atmosphere here. And what people do to prepare is that they make computer models that, um, that predict what different kinds of planets with different kinds of life on them might have. Um, and try to make those kind of general predictions so that when we start to get this data from this new telescope, that we'll be able to interpret it. I know that you've had some, um, you've been critical of the name 
that you use the acronym of JWST, the James Webb Space Telescope, and sort of bringing again these explorations back into Earth and back into politics a little bit. Um, what's the basis of your criticism of the naming? Yeah, um, so this particular mission is called James Webb after a former NASA administrator. Um, James Webb was the administrator during the Apollo era. And, you know, people have a great deal of nostalgia for NASA's um, sort of, you know, activities during Apollo and its successes. And so many people um, really appreciate James Webb as a NASA administrator. Um, but, you know, just recently I, I co-wrote with my colleagues, Chanda Prescott-Weinstein, um, Sarah Tuttle and Brian Nord, all of whom are also astronomers for Scientific American, um, that James Webb, prior to being a NASA administrator, was the Undersecretary of State. And specifically, he was the Undersecretary of State during what's called the Lavender Scare, which was the purge of LGBTQ people from the government service, from, from the State Department. And there has been, a, um, I would say, a far-ranging debate um, about sort of the nature of James Webb's role and the nature of um, what it means to be complicit or to participate in persecution. You know, the, the indications are that he was involved in conversations with underlings who, you know, ultimately may have carried out the details of the Lavender Scare. And I think the, the debate that is happening within the community right now is that, um, you know, for like I, I and a number of my co-authors on that article are queer people. And, you know, we see this telescope in the, in the way that we see the legacy of the Hubble Space Telescope as this possibility to be hugely inspiring. It is a name that will live on in the way that Hubble's name lives on because of the Space Telescope for people who have absolutely no idea who, you know, Edwin Hubble was. Um, and so, you know, the, the question is, you know, in much of the way we see debates over monuments happening over the past year, do we name something um, for someone who's, you know, uh, whose legacy is really complicit at best um, with this persecution that is still, frankly, you know, discrimination against queer people in the sciences continues to impact people's careers. And it also continues to impact the careers of, for example, diplomats or employees at the State Department working at home and abroad. Um, and, you know, this past year is actually like a record year for legislation against trans people. And so, you know, when we look at these uh, these issues, there's a tendency, I think, for many people to sort of view this as like, oh, the Lavender Scare happened in, you know, like the late 40s and early 50s and, you know, through the 50s. And that was so long ago. And then James mm -hmm. Webb went out into the Apollo program, leave him alone. But, you know, having a telescope named after you is an honor. It is not something that is owed to anybody. Right. Um, and we have this opportunity to name it for literally anyone who didn't persecute gay people would be great. Um, we suggested the Harriet Tubman Space Telescope. We think that has a nice ring to it. Harriet like Tubman that. navigated using the stars um, as part of the Underground Railroad. So, you know, I, I hope, I am hopeful that before the telescope launches later this year, that there will be a far more inspiring choice made and one that acknowledges the barriers that queer people still fa face um, in the sciences and, uh, you know, outside of the sciences as well. Well, the dialogue doesn't happen unless people raise it. And I think, again, the right people to raise it, you're exactly the right person to raise it because, again, coming from science, um, you know, people are going to give you more credence in this in this discussion, and at least, or at least I hope they do. Um, so we'll stay tuned and see how that how that plays out. You're incredibly prolific in your in your writing, and I just wanted to mention that you have a uh, a substack which is called not not rocket science although i understand you're you're moving that maybe so let's get to that in a, in a second but i just there's a, um you'll tell us in a minute how we find this content but uh, yes. well no tell us now how we find the content okay. and I'll, yeah. <laughs> where will we find your writing after today yeah sure um i actually just today launched a patreon um it's patreon.com slash not not rocket science because you know it's not rocket science but it's also not not rocket science um so that'll be home to writing video live q a's and all kinds of stuff um that was previously just a newsletter um existing on substack 
just making sure I had this right. So it's patreon.com slash not not rocket science. Everybody should it. check <laughs> this out. And we'll find there um, some of your writing, which I really like how you're working through ideas in, in your writing. And I just wanted to bring up one of these, which you're sort of musing right around the turn of the new year this year into 2021, but you were thinking back a year and what an interesting and important exercise for people to do to think just before pandemic times but you note in there i'm just quoting here astronomers usually have career paths that force us to pull up stakes and move around every few years and i'm no different which has been fun in some ways but also left me with little connection to my local community and you go on to talk about at that point um your desire in last year 2020 to get more engaged in community action um, there in Chicago um, and in struggle for justice uh, and community organizing and mutual aid. And then this pandemic happened. So I wanted to sort of get you to talk a little bit about how it turned out, but also say a little bit more too about kind of your commitments in that, in that regard. And after this year we've been through, one could choose so many different domains in American life to try to put your shoulder into it and try to get to some change. What are your commitments right now in that regard? Yeah, um, great question. So I would say that I have a, a pretty longstanding commitment to making change in a wide variety of ways. Um, you know, it started with in college, like food justice um, and morphed into, since we're, we're actually passing the anniversary of the beginning of the Iraq war, and there seems to be some collective amnesia about how many people objected to it. Um, I, you know, kind of got my, my, cut my teeth on organizing um, back in the early 2000s around anti-war activism. Um, you know, currently I would say that the majority of my work um, has been uh, in solidarity with the movement for black lives and in solidarity with um, indigenous movements, but specifically um, Kanaka, Mali, uh, Native Hawaiian uh, objections to the construction of the 30 meter telescope on their unceded homelands. Um, so, you know, I would say that those are kind of my two my my two current commitments, um, you know, but I, I in general have done a lot of organizing with friends who are, you know, fellow scientists who are maybe distributed around at different institutions around the country. And I did have this like, um, you know, New Year's resolution in 2020, a, a foolhardy phrase, if ever there, <laughs> there was one to think back on now. Um, that I really wanted to be more connected to Chicago because I had done, you know, a lot of showing up to movement, you know, actions here, but not any real organizing to speak of. Um, and so I, you know, went to like one transformative justice, like book group at, the, at the, you know, an institution here. And then um, I, you know, we locked down and I was like, well, now the heck what? <laughs> Um, and so, you know, I think uh, navigating that has been really interesting um, because, of course, like movements for, you know, racial justice around the murders of, you know, Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna T Taylor, like, um, you know, the list uh, unfortunately goes on and on, um, you know, that that popping off last year uh, presented some pretty unique challenges, especially for me. Um, I have an autoimmune disease and so I am very high risk and I can't go do a lot of actions um, just because, you know, in-person actions are really unpredictable. And if everybody wears a mask, that's great. But also we saw um, the Chicago police department kind of like beat our <laughs> movements up, quite literally beat our movements up. Um, all last summer. And so, you know, I like, I would like to be there. And at the same time, I also will die or be permanently disabled even more than I already am if I get COVID. So, you know, one of the things um, that I think has been interesting about the last year has been trying to find ways to tap in to existing things. Um, you know, in some cases, that's been listening to police scanners um, in in the course of uh, movements, you know, making sure that people are safe and that someone is, um, you know, listening for what's going on. Um, it's been mutual aid providing food for people. Um, I do some like uh, growing in community gardens here um, to provide, you know, food independence and sustenance for people. Um, again, food justice is very close to my heart, um, mostly because I like food and I like eating and I think everybody should be able to eat. Um, but I, I, I do think that, um, 
the movements of the last year have um, created or or strengthened, I would say, um, a very wide ranging, um, pretty inclusive abolitionist network within um, Chicago. And so, you know, the I worked with the defund CPD campaign, which is our local, um, you know, campaign, much like many cities have to defund the Chicago Police Department. Um, and let me be clear that I mean to zero. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I've been really gratified by is that in this time um, when our movements are coming together, I would say there's an enhanced focus on disability justice that makes being able to say something like, I'm immunocompromised and I cannot come to this thing in person, an okay thing to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because of course, one of the um, one of the things about abolition is that you wanna bring your full self um, kind of into the future. And we're trying to build a future in which people are acknowledged as full human beings. And part of that means being able to make space in movements, um, not that it's perfect by any means, but being able to make space in movements for people who have different ways that they can contribute and you know whose disability may prevent them from contributing in sort of like the classical like picture of an activist like holding a sign or chaining themselves to something. Um, you know, not that I'm not looking forward to being fully vaccinated so I can be a problem again. <laughs> Well, thank you for, for sharing that. I just want to remind folks that you're listening to COVID Calls, and I'm talking with astronomer, astrobiologist, Lucy Ann Walkowicz today. And we're almost up on time, but I want to, if you'll indulge me, get to just a couple other quick topics. One, um, kind of how we met, um, which was actually around music and around student radio in Baltimore back in the previous century. Um, and you stay very engaged in music and art um, as a consumer, but also as a producer, a person who makes music and art. And I want to just make sure people can find um, some of that work is available um, at your website, tangledfields.com. And you can check out some of the things that you've done there. Um, what's it been like during this pandemic year to be a creator? Complicated. Um, you know, I, I think in some ways, uh, you know, I perhaps thought at the beginning of this, like, aha, so much time at home. <laughs> yeah, a lot um, of people thought that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it turns out it's actually very difficult to like be creative when you're like extremely worried all the time. Um, and when like you're surrounded by death and destruction, I mean, I, I guess that's maybe generative for some people, but for me, it actually made it almost impossible to write for months on end. Um, and you know the the majority of my creative output now is either you know live music um, or performing aerial circus arts, which both of which are things that you do in person with other people. Um, so one of the things that's been really frustrating is the loss of our music scene here in Chicago. You know, which is very important to me. Like I, most of my friends here I know from playing in bands. Um, you know, I met my husband because we started a planned uh, band together. Um, you know, so this is really like something that was very much in the fabric of my life in Chicago and then sort of evaporated and hasn't really like been possible at all for a long time. I'm very glad that, you know, there has been some federal support for venues um, because, you know, like the venues are really kind of the lifeblood of a lot of the Chicago music scene. Um, and you know, that the idea of losing our venues has been like absolutely something that is just in a locked box in my brain that I cannot think about. Um, so, you know, I've been happy to see places surviving. Um, but at the same time, you know, like I, uh, so I do aerial silks, which if people don't know what these things are, if you've, seen like clips of Cirque du Soleil where somebody's like climbing up some curtains or maybe like hanging from an iron hoop. That's the stuff that I do, um, which obviously I cannot do in my house. Um, and so our aerial gym has been, you know, like closed or in like a very, very reduced amount of open um, for the entire year. And that's kind of forced me into other practices like trying to learn like handstands and hand balancing because I can do it in my house. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to go and do those things again, because that outlet is really important to me. And it's also like how I manage, like my, uh, disability is like very related to how much exercise I'm getting. 
Um, and so that has been like a whole other aspect of managing the pandemic has just been things shifting all the time and changing all the time. And, you know, prior to closing down, I was like, boy, I want to work at home more often, but it was so that I could go and like access the gym more easily, um, yeah. that I would like feel better in my body. And then, you know, this was sort of not the version of working from home that I was hoping for yeah. said everybody ever. Um, so yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's been complicated and I am really looking forward to that artistic outlet being available to me again. Uh, I want to validate that feeling. And I think a lot of people had that maybe early on. They're like, okay, if I'm going to be home, I'm going to make the best of it. And there was this sort of rash of like home baking and, and crafts <laughs> and everything. And then by May, a lot of that had disappeared because people were just like, this is not the terms on which I can be creative and optimistic. Um, yeah. So you're definitely not alone in that regard. What's the name of your band? Uh, so right now, well, <laughs> right now, uh, we had a, a band called Ahori Cohen. Um, our previous band was called Ditch Club, and both of those groups are on uh, Bandcamp. Um, if you, it's ditchclub.bandcamp.com is the um, the band that my husband and I started together. They actually also um, they so it's different for everybody because my husband has been able to create their own like solo album this year, which is amazing. Um, so wow. their name is Frank OK, uh, OK A Y. Um, so if you go look at Frank OK on Bandcamp, you will hear their beautiful album. Um, me, not so much. Have not really picked up the guitar very much this year. <laughs> and you were in a Werner Herzog film. I was in a Werner Herzog film. Um, yeah, I invited him on COVID calls. He, he. I got an, I got a, I got a reply, uh, not yeah. from him. <laughs> and it said, it said, uh, Mr. Herzog is not interested in doing the podcast, which I thought was a great response. I was like, okay. Somebody thought about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what um, was that like? Uh, it, so I will say that Werner is exactly like he appears to be in his movies. There is absolutely nothing that is artifice about the way he narrates his films. Um, it was amazing for me. Uh, I got an email from them. Um, I guess we recorded it in 2015, 20, yeah, 2015, 2016, maybe. No, 2015. Um, so I got an email from them saying that they were doing this movie on the um, the internet, and you know, did I want to be interviewed? And I immediately freaked out because I am a huge Werner Herzog fan. Yeah. I have on my shoulder. Whoops! How do I move this towards the thing? This is a tattoo of the cave at Shavi that I got after seeing his Cave of Forgotten Dreams, and so I immediately freaked out. Responded to the email insisted my coworker take a picture of my shoulder and send it to them and then was like, I've done that. They're not going to let me anywhere near Werner Herzog. <laughs> um, no, but that was the audition. And, that was well. the audition and you passed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, for me, that was an amazing experience just because I never imagined in a million years that I would get to meet Werner Herzog, let alone like be in that film. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciated that experience was a very like special one. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's it's because you're great at what you do. And then you've got this whole, <laughs> it's a whole additional platform of people who might not be aware of the kind of things that, that you do. And then you find, they find you through the interesting world and the interesting mind of Werner Herzog. My <laughs> kids, my kids have been watching, you know, he does the Mandalorian, he's been acting. Yes. And my, my kids, so we watched that and I didn't do much setup about who Werner Herzog was. And they both are like, that one guy, he's, he's really kind of weird, but like, I can't, they really, they really like him. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Join the rest of the world. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I kind of don't want the conversation to end, but we're up on time. In fact, I've kept you too long, but um, I really thank you for the time, Lucienne, and for kind of really talking about your science in the context of this pandemic and, and the things that have sort of kept you going through this oh, year. Such and a pleasure. I just want to remind folks you've been listening to COVID Calls and you can catch COVID Calls every weekday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time. And I'll be talking to writer Liz Lenz tomorrow about um, the American heartland and about uh, partisanship and ways that Americans are trying to find to come together through this pandemic. And we'll also talk about her recent book about pregnancy and motherhood. Please join me for that. And thanking my guest again, Lucianne Walkowicz, and you can check out her work at patreon.com 
slash not not rocket science as well as um, Adler Planetarium and the many other um, events that I'm sure you'll be doing as soon as you're sprung from this COVID trap, right? Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Lucienne. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow, 530. Thank you.